will also find Richard today from 1 to 3 p.m. at Electronium booth, as well as here on the main stage again for a panel happening at 5 o'clock. Now let's continue with our first panel of the day and for that I would like to welcome the panel moderator Freya Stevens who is a PR and marketing specialist working in blockchain and fintech sectors and she's also the founding member of the collective. I would also like to welcome other panelists, Philip Sandner who is the head of Frankfurt School Blockchain Center, Lauren Sabo, who is a manager of BDO, and also Gloria Wu, who is the chief of global ecosystem partnerships of Ontology. Freya, on to you. Hi, thank you. Thanks to everyone who's joining the show today. Um, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Um, my name is Freya. Um, I'm pleased to be moderating the panel today um, on Libra China and the digital programmable Euro, getting real about CBDC. Um, it's a big topic. We have a short session, but we're going to do our best to take you through um, the insights that we have for you today. And I'm very pleased to have with you some of the best intelligentsia in the field of CBDCs. Um, you've already been introduced, so uh, we won't do that. But um, perhaps we will just jump straight in, given our time constraints. And I wonder if we could begin with you, Philip. Um, few people have thought more deeply about the different forms a digital euro might take. And it's a hot topic right now with China's digital currency test phase underway um, and uh, COVID-19. There seems to be a sudden need for other countries to get their digital currencies out the door. Um, so I wonder if you could talk to us about what are the options for the euro and are any of them a good fit? Yeah, um, I think uh, that's a very good question. It's a hot topic these days in politics, uh, economics, startups, corporations. Not too many people, to be very honest, understand what we are talking about here, uh, especially in the level of decision makers. Um, but it's, uh, in my mind, it's pretty clear that the digital programmable euro, as I call it, will at some point of time come. Uh, there are three big variants here. So first of all, you could do it with uh, the central bank. Uh, that would be a CBDC that would be run by the European Central Bank. This, uh, the ECB is experimenting in this field. Uh, but to be honest, uh, it's not going too quickly, not as quick as in China. Therefore, it will take probably five, six, or maybe seven years until we are uh, uh, live here uh, with the ECB-initiated CBDC. Alternatively, you could run the uh, euro by a private organization with all licenses required on top of existing change. This could be ran on, to on top of ontology. It could be ran on top of uh, the Ethereum network and so on. Um, so plugging a token in euro denoted on top of existing public blockchain systems, this would work. And the third version where I, th where I think that this will be the most interesting one and uh, is the one where the euro would run on top of Libra, Facebook's Libra project. So you, uh, so you take the euro, put it in a token on top of Libra. It's called euro. It's not a stable coin anymore. And I think this could be uh, coming to us uh, early next year. So these are the three main variants. I would think that the Libra version is the is the is probably the one which gets the most traction as of 2021. Okay, that's so interesting. Um, I, I'd like to bring Lorenz in at this point to talk a bit about the the Libra project and whether he thinks this global payment system is going to disrupt the future, um, or whether people will be running scared due to its um, ties with Facebook, um, fears over surveillance, some dubbing it as the Big Brother coin. Um, yes, your thoughts, Lorenz. Good morning. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it's an interesting discussion. When I started researching this topic, uh, it is so changing, so fluid what's happening, especially with Libra. Uh, they just introduced uh, a new CEO. Uh, they have partners coming in, um, disappearing. My main point with Libra is actually uh, coming from the paper they published. And in the paper, they point out that the barrier of entry for banking is very high still in developing countries. And they quote the US dollar for a smartphone and probably the Libra Association as the solution for this problem. And this is where my, my little gear started turning around. I said, well, well, one moment, please. The US dollar for a smartphone is actually here. We have US dollar 100 smartphones. And privacy researchers have been pointing out that these smartphones are a sucker for data. So they do a lot of data analytics to finance these cheap smartphones. So they're not so good, actually. And the other thing is um, the argument in the, in the white paper is uh, that uh, for third worlds, they would enable payment systems. 
if you look at existing payment systems like M-Pesa, uh, they're already doing very well. So the question is, who are they competing with? What is the idea of, of, of Facebook or the Libra Association here? And if you look at the current members of the association, this is why I have such a hard time uh, to combine them with the central banking digital currencies is it's almost all private companies. Uh, we talk about Uber, Spotify, Shopify, and a few others. So for me, Libra right now has the feeling more or less of a shopping um, system where you know you get points uh, if you use this uh, system and you have all the partners integrated. And um, if you look at the history of the criticism against Libra, of course, the first argument was against pegging it against the US dollar or any other uh, reserve uh, currency, where they say that Libra would really benefit from that, but not the users. And the more interesting argument against Libra came a few days later from economists from UK, actually, who said, well, it's not so much about the digital money with Libra. It's more about uh, Facebook becoming the digital identity provider that this currency would enable them. So this is basically my current stance on the Libra. And uh, I think it's very exciting to continue if they can go into the central banking digital currency with this or not. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to bring Gloria in now um, to speak about the situation in China. Um, of course, it's one of the first major economies to unveil a digital currency called the DCEP, for, for those who are new to the topic. Um, and uh, while Europe is, while we're busy modeling the impact of different designs on our infrastructures in, in Europe, China is pushing ahead. I, I feel like this is a race. Um, so can you tell us what the DCEP um, is about and who is it aimed at? Sure. Um, thank you, Freya, for the question. Um, I think this could also be connected to the previous conversations um, uh, we're having at this panel discussion. Uh, so DCEP stands for Digital Currency Electronic Payment. So it's basically, um, it's not really based on blockchain. It's basically a digital currency that is uh, part of the monetary policy, monetary system of the central bank in China. Uh, so from my point of view, the reason why uh, uh, the central bank of China introduced uh, DCEP, there are several reasons, right? So the first one, we need to um, take a look at the, uh, the global um, dynamics of the financial system and its competition. So this is also the background why we now see Libra is also being a challenger that uh, providing an alternative um, fiat uh, uh, remittance solution, uh, challenging the positions of several central banks in the world. So traditionally, uh, US dollars has been the primary uh, remittance currency that is dominating the global uh, economy, right? So for um, something like Libra to develop, it's also going to have its own system that is also very much connected to the US uh, dollars. So from the uh, from this macro point of view, uh, of course, you can imagine that China would be interested in building something of their, of their own, trying to also introduce uh, the Chinese currency to become more internationalized. So this is one of the very important motivation and also the progress with Libra definitely uh, accelerated the whole progress. Second one is, um, uh, it's, uh, it's also together with the general theme of this concept called the new uh, infrastructure building that is happening in the Chinese economy. So China has been benefiting a lot in the last decades in terms of building infrastructures. Um, and because of the infrastructure building of uh, bridges, of railways, of um, real estates, it's actually give a big uh, basis for the economic growth in the last decades. So now we are also seeing we need a new stimulation for the growth. So the government um, has uh, come up with this uh, policy called the new infrastructure investment. So the estimated investment is going to be around 150 billion euros around this uh, uh, new thing. So what is included in this new thing? It's basically FinTech. It's um, 5G, it's uh, blockchain, it's uh, uh, artificial intelligence and all these technological infrastructure of our future economy. 
So uh, with the introduction of DCEP, that also opens up a lot of investment and innovation space for fintech related uh, sectors. So this is the second reason. The third one is also very much um, uh, connected to the current pandemic situation we're facing, right? So uh, overall, a lot of governments are uh, having liquidity released to the market to help the economy to overcome this difficult phase. But um, it could be very ineffective. Like from the experiences of the Chinese central bank, every time when they try to provide liquidity, many of such liquidity is basically going to stock market, right? So it doesn't really go into the real economy that helps people. Uh, so if there's a traceable, programmable digital money uh, used for such uh, stimulation, economic stimulation policies, they can, they can more specifically target those individuals or those companies to use the money to put in their, uh, their productions, to put in their consumptions that can have a better effect of stimulating their economy. So these are the uh, what I see as a major reason why the CEP is introduced. Of course, it, it drastically uh, decreases the cost for issuing the paper money. Um, the estimated amount of the reduction of the cost for issuing and circulating and uh, um, managing the whole paper money is around like 30 billion euros every single year. So that money could be saved for something else. Uh, but I think the last reason is uh, more of a minor reason compared with the other ones. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I just want to rewind a little bit because you said that the DCP um, has an aim to make um, the yuan more uh, internationalized. Um, I, I put a question about uh, the, the DCP to Tim Draper last week, and um, he seems to be of the opinion that um, you know, the, the currency will be fairly close to the world. Um, and of course, he, he likes the idea of a free, free market economy. Um, and, you know, it's quite scathing where there are uh, digital currencies are restricted to old state lines. Um, so I just wonder if, um, you know, how do you think the DCEP will help the yuan to become more internationalized? How will it compete maybe against the American dollar, which some people have been saying it might do? Um, you know, if it's still sort of fairly walled in. Um, and that question is, is, is for anybody really, but yeah, maybe you would like to take it first because it's your, your area. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Excellent question. Um, my personal opinion, I think it will be a very difficult approach <laughs> for the internalization of the, the Chinese yen. Uh, I think the ideal is great. Uh, it's also a strategic move, but uh, just tying this whole digital currency with absolute um, uh, progression with internalization, I think that's a little bit of a uh, way to go. Yeah, because you, you will need uh, a lot of uh, international transactions and remittance in using the digital uh, currency, but basically it's still promoting the Chinese yen as the major uh, trade and remittance uh, clearance uh, currency. Um, I think a more sustainable way would be continue to promote trade. So the, there's more uh, consumption purchasing power coming outside of the country to, to import more from the world. Uh, and then that could help with the internationalization. But just relying on DCEP to be the miracle worker for this to happen, I personally think that's not going to happen that way. Mm. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else ha have an opinion on this or we, we can move on to the next question if not? Okay, we're in. I, I would like to quickly jump in with my, with my example of the Petro, which had a very similar goal. Um, it should also create something to compete against the US dollar and help Venezuela to circumvent um, uh, sanctions and sanction control. And they created this digital currency. Uh, one can argue it was the first CBDC. Uh, in record time, I think in one month, and they packed it against reserves that later turned out not to be really existent or not, so nobody really knows. But the problem with the concept was that, um, I would like to quote a uh, Washington Post economic reporter, Matt O'Brien, and he said, the picture is about creating something useless. That's why only foreigners can buy them, but only Venezuelans can spend them. And I think if you create a currency to compete against an international trade currency like the US dollar is and the, the euro 
That means he still tries to become more and more. Uh, you have to watch out that you do not impose too many rules and regulations how foreigners can use your digital currency to consume your goods and uh, to facilitate trade with your country. Mm. Can, uh, I would also like to add one more point. For example, in Germany, you sometimes have the situation uh, that you can pay with credit cards, EC cards, and all kinds of other uh, possibilities. Um, and very, very rarely right now, you see that uh, German retailers are now connecting WeChat to serve Chinese tourists, right? And that's interesting because uh, right now you have like WeChat uh, for transporting the money, but in the future, this could be a Libra, this could be the DCEP uh, uh, Chinese uh, currency. And therefore, I think um, in that it can be quicker than we expect. Uh, it's regulatory, not, not easy. And also the transactions uh, need to be uh, scalable. I think there are tons of hurdles there. But uh, the Chinese system at this point of time is one of the most active ones out there. Um, apparently, there are first workers in China who are getting their salary denoted in their digital version of the local Chinese currency. That's that's really massive, given that all other central banks in the world, except some smaller ones, are very uh, are much slower here and not so much progressed. Now, in my personal opinion is that next year we will see some kind of, yeah, fight is the wrong word, but some kind of competition. You have the Chinese system live on the one hand side and you have the uh, Libra system uh, live on the other hand side. Um, and other major central banks, they are quite then some years ahead uh, from starting their systems becoming live, right? That's my opinion, but it would be interesting to see if you, somebody would uh, reject this. Yes, I, am. Uh, I definitely agree with um, uh, both, both of you on this point. Um, definitely, I think from the point of view of uh, ontology, which is a public protocol that provides the infrastructure for many of such innovations, uh, we're not directly connected to the uh, non-blockchain DCEP uh, infrastructure, right? So uh, I think for for the rest of the world, it is a good thing that the Chinese government's being very uh, progressive on this front. That sort of steers a very healthy competition. Um, one of the major backgrounds for China to be so fast is also that the the digital payment is, is penetrating very, very uh uh, very, very fast in China. So according to a central bank report in 2019, last year, basically more than 82% of the adults now in China uh, use digital payments. So this is the infrastructure that is not yet seen in uh, Europe and also the rest of the world, where credit cards and other payment systems are still very much dominant. So that is also the reason why uh, this digital currency could be implemented faster. So we could hope that um, the European Central Bank and also uh, different governments will be also faster. And I believe if we can really digitalize currencies, uh, it's definitely going to unleash a lot of potential for fintech development around the world. Um, I would like to interject here. There's one thing I'm missing in this discussion right now. Uh, the donation of DCEP is right now by economists, it's digital cash. It's not a central banking digital currency with, uh, as the biz defined, for example, with the retail and wholesale concept. Uh, some say it's more or less just a digital cash version, like any other payment system. So I would love to hear what, what for example, an economist has to say about this statement right now. Mm, I should take this question, right? So if, at this point of time, it's, it's too early to really say uh, what's going on here. You know, like the system is uh, not much known as about the system. Uh, there are some media reports about it. Some people are even doubting that it's an underlying DLT uh, framework. Uh, so, so there's not too much knowledge. Uh, and I also know things which I read from the media. So I also might be wrong, of course. So I think it's too early to judge. Um, I, but I agree, it's a digital version of uh, physical cash. China seeks to um, remove physical cash out of their system. Um, of course, this also has uh, transparency um, uh, implications for sure. Um, but you can probably easily expand such a system for industrial usages, interbank payments, machine to machine payments, and so on. Uh, once you have this technology live, you know, this is in my mind a major block where others are struggling. Uh, they have done this first version where probably first transactions are really being done. That's the Chinese worker getting the money. Um, and from this, you can probably easily expand uh, to other domains where uh, DLT-based payments can work, right? 
and and then it gets really exciting yeah but we are just seeing the the birth uh, of cbdc's in real and um and but the implications are not known yet that's why china um get is getting started slowly you know they are not rolling this out immediately to one billion people but first uh, doing like tests in first couple of cities if i got the media reports right Um, I, I just wonder if uh, whether uh, digital currencies, particularly digital cash, uh, is is pro financial inclusion or whether it's actually um, uh, going to promote financial exclusion. Because cash, of course, especially as you you mentioned, Gloria, is a much more um, still in use in Europe. Um, I think it's something like was it sixty seven percent of all transactions are still in cash. Um, and uh, of course, the older generations uh, are very slow to adopt new technology, if at all. Um, you know, are we are we going to need a period of uh, of having two two things running together? How long will it last for? Will it be like checks? Will they still be around in a hundred years' time? <laughs> um, just you know, who's going to have the facilities um, to to sort of accept all these different forms of payment? Are we going to leave people behind? Is is my main question. But um, Philip, perhaps you want to take that one first so um right now you have multiple payment systems in place you know they are like integrated silos you have the cell phone up here the payment infrastructure national worldwide down here and then you have like this network with tons of end devices and these end devices are sitting for example with retailers uh, when you purchase things you know this is how the system is currently running and you have multiple such, net such networks i've been in thailand last year and then you see that it at one retailer, you have like eight devices of eight payment networks, right? And in the future, I think this will dramatically change. You might have, for example, Facebook's Libra as a payment infrastructure on the lower half. Uh, sorry, Philip, we've, I think we've lost you there. Yeah. You've uh, frozen. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, Lorenzo, do you want to... Um, Step in. Yeah, I will try to, to jump in quickly. Um, I, I would like to bring in a, a very, very funny example where you see the, the central banking digital currency is a little bit stall in the, in the deployment. Um, if you look back a few years ago, uh, when they legalized uh, Mariana in the US on a, on a local level, local state level, um, the producers had two problems. Uh, the first was security. And the second was payment systems for selling the Mariana because uh, from a federal level in the US, it was still prohibited. So the private security part was solved. It was easily solved. They found some private uh, security companies jumping in for the, what the police would do because the police would not secure these plants and they would not help these plant owners if there was a legal problem. Um, and a lot of these uh, Mariana owners, these producers, suddenly became crypto billionaires or millionaires and started to live a good life uh, now as expats somewhere in Southeastern Asia or Southeastern America. Um, why did this happen? Because banks told them uh, from federal standpoint and anti-money laundering laws and KYC, we're not allowed to take your money that you are making from Mariana. And um, I think um, that shows how Bitcoin as a crypto anarchistic currency was able to help in this gray area, which was not completely illegal or legal. You could not uh, really say that today. Uh, but a central banking digital currency with all the, the ideas of central banks, which are bringing back the central into the CBDC, uh, they would have a hard time to allow uh, to facilitate such trades. And I think this is fascinating uh, if CBDCs can, can really settle such trades in the future and how they will be adapted or they're just a regulatory uh, currency framework that only big companies and big organizations will use. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, oh, we've, we've got Philip back now. So sorry, Philip, uh, we, I don't know quite how far we got into what you were saying, but um, if you'd like to give it another go. Oh, we've lost you again. Sorry, everybody. Uh, we today, and therefore it's. Uh... You're back. Yeah, I'm on holiday today, actually. Therefore, uh, I'm in a rural area where there is not much cell reception. That's quite tiring, I know. 
So, um, so you, um, you were saying I hope you can. Yeah. So I will resume with the question. So right now you have payment networks and in the future, I could imagine that this could be based on Facebook's Libra, for example. And then, then it will get really exciting when you have multiple de devices which are able to connect to one payment infrastructure, which could be Libra, but also another public or private chain. Okay, but we already see um, that some some retail outlets are not accepting cash already because there is the option for, um, you know, contactless payments with card. Um, so I just wonder if we're, we're sort of ushering a situation in where we, we will, we will um, you know, prohibit more people from, from taking part in the economy. Um, but that was just my thoughts. So I don't, maybe, okay. maybe, maybe we move on. Um, no, I think, and I think it, that's excellent thoughts, you know, but I think, I think, I think you have two relevant conditions here which need to be in place. You have to have a uh, universal payment network. This could be Libra. But you also have to get identity management rights such that people can onboard to the system. Yeah? So in case you are requiring pass passports and identity cards and so on, then the hurdle is so high that you cannot get financial inclusion. But in case you are having other approaches, you know, biometric identities, then it gets exciting. Okay. Um, in terms of of Libra, um, is it in, so I know you're very pro, pro the technology, um, Philip, but is it in the public interest to, um, to team up with the, the private sector like that? Um, and of course, Facebook is so powerful. Um, what, what would be, would there be risks involved in terms of the, the, the technology itself? Obviously it's, you know, blockchain is still very new. Um, and anyone who's been in the crypto space for five minutes knows that, you know, there's all sorts of uh, new ways that people find to kind of hack the technology and, and um, you know, and, and insert bugs into it. I mean, what, what are the risks of using something like Libra or any, or any platform for that matter? Um, should these things not be built in-house? That's a very, very uh, good question, but it's a difficult question. Um, because typically innovations are coming from the private sector. Uh, typically innovations are not coming from the government or from the public sector. Therefore, at some point of time, you have to rely on private industries. You know, take cars, machines, industrial uh, goods and so on. The car is not, uh, the, the government is not innovating. It's the companies and that needs to be here as well. Actually, we just see the same with an American credit card company uh, that just filed a patent for creating a digital fiat with a central entity computer where the uh, where the central bank, the Fed, could plug in. And it was the same argument that the authors brought. Uh, it is that the innovation is coming from this American credit card company uh, for drawing up a digital fiat currency system uh, where the Fed could plug in. And yeah, and um, why, why Libra, why not? one of these other protocols um philip i know you've written a paper on the comparisons uh between fabric and quarter and others um why not one of these protocols why libra yeah that's interesting because I, in my personal opinion is with libra you already have like massive touch points towards end customers you know in case uh Facebook is plugging in Libra in their apps. You have immediately, you know, dozens or hundreds, millions of people who might use it. And this way you get these networks effects uh, under control where other uh, blockchain projects have really big difficulties getting enough participants such that people like to use it and have fun to use it because there are other people in the that the only one uh, which is able to invest, you know, and Facebook can solve it by um, uh, creating like massive adoption quite quickly. That's why I believe at this point of time, Libra uh, will be a game changer. But one, one point here, I think Facebook made, made a very big mistake. They somehow associated Libra with Facebook. And therefore, I also typically say it's Facebook's Libra. But that's pretty bad because that's, that creates a bad reputation because of these uh, privacy issues. I think uh, afterwards it's always easier, I know. But, but it would have been better for Facebook to disassociate Libra in the beginning because then uh, the resistance by governments and central banks would have been much uh, lower. I think there was a strategic mistake, uh, mistake which, yeah, but it's easy to criticize this afterwards. Yeah? Uh, but just mentioning it. Okay. 
Um, does anyone else have any thoughts uh, on that topic? Yeah, if I may, if I may add, I definitely very much agree with uh, what Professor Sanders said about private sector innovation and also the strategic mistake that I might have uh, made. And I think also I, I mentioned this point in some other conferences as well. I don't understand why they uh, picked U.S. and Europe uh, uh, regulation uh, system, the regulatory system first. Because Libra might be a very good alternative for many other um, uh, financial infrastructures in many parts of the world, providing a much more efficient, cheaper, and also more inclusive financial services to many people, right? Um, I just don't understand why they pick the most difficult markets to enter because of regulations. Maybe they should start with um, some other parts of the world. True, true. Digital currency obviously has some some great uh, use cases where where people are unbanked, and yeah, why pick why pick countries where uh, you know we do have great banking infrastructure, um, and and maybe they mentioned Facebook tactically um, as a sort of marketing ploy. So <laughs> lots of people on the Facebook platform, um, you know, and maybe it's just us, uh, you know, people close to the cryptocurrency community that uh, run scared from from the concept of surveillance. There are a lot of people who obviously, um, you know, are quite happy to give their details over. Um, so well, go for it. If, I, if I can jump in quickly here, actually Libra uh, or Libra got an endorsement by the former Chinese central banking president uh, apologies for might not say the name correctly, Li Hui, and he brought up a few very interesting points in the recent discussion uh, about why he sees Libra uh, as a as a front runner right now for the develop, development of a CBDC, and uh, maybe we will see some concepts of Libra uh, merging into the DCP. Yeah, I don't know how that works because Facebook is not allowed in China. <laughs> creates a little bit of com complexity, but yeah, I can see um, probably in the in a way of collaborating with um, this new challenger financial infrastructure provider, there could be some space for uh, meaningful collaborations. Can I add one more point concerning uh, the the private way of payments? You know what we should not underestimate here. You know if I have a credit card or in, in Germany an easy card or in, I, in case I use PayPal, it's always private organizations which are maintaining the system such that payment is being done. It's not the government, it's not the ECB. The European Central Bank is operating in the background, but if I as a retail person uh, spending money somewhere, it's always private organizations. So it can be a bank, but it could also be Libra's consortium. So therefore, from my perspective, uh, I don't feel that it's an issue uh, that private organizations are running payment infrastructure. It's not changing anyway, like in the last decades, you know, where also private companies are running payment infrastructure for retail people. And 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 I, I agree. I, I'm playing devil's advocate a bit. Um, you know, so some of the the most um, trusted technology has got to be the stuff that's um, that's been in open source for some time and has had you know uh, every dev under the sun look over it and and um, that's probably uh, better than than building something second rate in house. Um, and not to mention that developers, are, uh, blockchain developers, are really hard to get hold of. Um, so we, we've not got very long left. Um, so I'm going to throw the questions um, out to the uh, to the audience. Um, and there's one here um, that that I wanted to ask anyway. So um, is it valid to talk about a threat to the current banking system, or is um, CBDC to be seen as a natural transformation um, process going on? And um, my, my take on that is, um, will are, are we going to make banks irrelevant um, if if currencies are coming straight from central banks? Uh, so, um, uh, Philip? I can try. Uh, so, uh, I would argue that it's a natural transformation. I think everything is getting digital, everything is getting dematerialized, information has gotten dematerialized. Imagine like 30 years ago, we had letters and stamps and postal offices for moving uh, information and paper around. Now we send WhatsApps and emails, right? So, information transmission has become entirely digital. Money is still physical or the entire area of notaries, you know, like uh, real estate stuff and so on. Uh, value is written on paper, stamped and signed with a real 
um, pencil, for example. That's how value transfer is being done currently. And this is, of course, all moving digital now. So in my mind, it's a natural digital transformation. We have moving information that's, you know, like the letter. 30 years ago, we have moved all information online. And now we are moving value online. And therefore, it's the natural next step. But of course, governments and regulatory bodies need to need to be concerned and need to basically also provide rules uh, because otherwise privacy cannot be kept. Transparency should be there for in some reasons, uh, but it, but in general, uh, I being in Germany would like to uh, keep uh, part of the intransparency which is provided by physical cash. You know that's for privacy reasons. Um, so therefore, um, um, we need to maintain these values. But it's a logical next step that uh, all value transfers including also real estate and stocks and security tokens, everything is moving digital and DLT is the infrastructure for this. If I may chime in, I also see it complementary and a lot of banks would love to do more with cryptocurrencies, enter more the market with cryptocurrencies. In Austria, one of the uh, biggest banks is now exploring uh, bringing out their own cryptocurrency. Uh, I know it's a big hurdle for banks to use cryptocurrencies in regards of uh, know your customer and any money laundering, where also technologies are coming up more and more to support these companies, uh, to support these banks, excuse me, with solutions to track where the payments are coming from and who is behind the payment. And um, the identity is also the problem with the, with the cryptocurrencies right now. I also agree, and I think this is the, the strongest point of a central banking digital currency that it should be government-backed. The framework or the, the methodology, at least, should be government-backed. And it is up for the private companies, the banks, uh, to facilitate the settlement of it and to protect it also. Because we know that uh, the private industry is doing a lot to protect infrastructure. And uh, in some cases, when we look at government websites, they sometimes do a better job than some government websites. I think I just have one more point to add. I can see how there could be a political struggle in terms of power between the commercial banks and the central banks in terms of who holds the cards for the future. But uh, I agree with all the panelists that this is the um, inevitable trend in history. So the smart way would be for the commercial banks to also jump on, on the card and uh, look for more opportunities rather than to uh, just try to block in the risks um, of the presence, but more focusing on building the future. Yeah, and I, I feel already as if the banks are, are receding somewhat, uh, the retail banks are receding somewhat into the background um, because we have many incumbents now coming in to the digital payment space, app-based um, payment services. Um, you know, the younger generation is really embracing those. Um, and, and I wonder if um, they are already, um, you know, they're just bolting things onto existing infrastructure and, and they should be building, uh, you know, their own challenges from the ground up um, to stay relevant. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, it's uh, we've touched a little bit on this, but um, how do CBDCs benefit ordinary people? And they're specifically um, asking about the government surveillance aspect. So um, if we are looking at introducing a digital currency that is a, a digital cash, um, cash obviously is fairly anonymous. Um, so can we expect, um, should we expect a digital currency that emulates cash to maintain that feature? Obviously in China, I don't think that it is, um, but in, in, uh, in as far as a digital euro goes, uh, if it's designed to be cash, uh, we'll, should we expect it to have track and trace built into the design? Um, does GDPR protect us against that? Um, I understand in the US it's unconstitutional, um, but perhaps there are some thoughts from the panel on that. I can I can give a try. So I think um, I think this is all right. It, it needs to be balanced, transparency and privacy. But also we should be very uh, honest here. Our payments today are not um, private in any way. So for example, I would say with my monthly budget, 80% are going via a bank account. And uh, in the records, uh, somebody could look into, uh, be it the state or be it the bank, being some kind of algorithm, 80% of my money transfer uh, is basically being digital and can be monitored with credit cards and so on. How many, how much money am I physically spending with physical cash? So how, what is the share of really being private money 
per month, maybe if at all 20%, probably even less, maybe just 5%. So privacy is already gone. Therefore, to some degree, uh, um, this discussion is basically, um, yeah, it's important, definitely, and we need to ensure privacy in the future, but it, it's, it's just relevant for 5% of the money transactions, I would guess so. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, a, a um, final question. Sorry. Oh, go for well, it. I, I can also yeah, speak to that point a little bit. Um, definitely agree with what Professor Sanders said. Um, I think the bigger challenge here is the digitalization of all our data and uh, online, offline uh, presence, right? So that's a bigger question that is very pressing. Uh, the solution from the industry's point of view is definitely decentralized uh, identity, self-sovereignty over your data and access to your information. Um, so that should be solved by the DLT technology and uh, the awareness from people is important, but, but it doesn't really go uh, beyond as a separate question in terms of privacy protection. So that should happen already to protect your online uh, browsing history to protect your other type of information from being uh, seen and analyzed and utilized for other purposes, commercial purposes or um, very risky um, frauds or controlling from, from other third parties, could be government, could be also commercial organizations. Okay. Um how close are we to issuing the digital euro? Um, can we put a timeline on it um, too soon? And maybe we haven't looked at all the risks, but um, leave it too long. And you know, we'll, we'll be uh, late adopters, I feel. Uh, Lorenz, mm. do you want to uh, take a first take on this one? Well, looking at the European scene of software development and uh, high technology, we have our strengths, but it's definitely not developing a digital banking currency, I think. Um, I hope uh, sooner or later there will be a framework that is adapted by all members of the ECB and that will lead to uh, a system because otherwise I fear we will adapt something else and that might be Libra, it might be another stable coin. There are some other interesting stable coins out there. It's not only Libra as we talk today. Um, or we, we really risk uh, losing the train here. So this is my thought about it. I, I would argue that uh, that it really depends um, on the platform. You know, a blockchain in my mind is some kind of transport platform on which the euro is running. So therefore, in case we would rely on a system, a system created by the European Central Bank, I think we would have to wait for six years or maybe seven years, maybe just five years. But in case we are Libra, uh, then next year. Um, but already, I know there are a couple of companies who are um, working on this. That, for example, Landesbank Baden-Württemberg and uh, some other startups uh, which are already experimenting with the real euro on the blockchain. Okay. Um, is, is it ever going to be a possibility that we will have a, a country putting its currency out um, globally? So um, it's just a, a harebrained idea, um, but say, say we were to put the, the euro out and anybody could adopt it. Um, I mean, there's a couple of countries that have already adopted the euro and it's, it's not legal tender. I think it's uh, Kosovo and um, Montenegro. Um, but w I mean, they're, they're not, they're frowned on obviously, but uh, at the same time, is it not the greatest opportunity um, to, to have um, multiple cur current uh, countries take up your digital currency? Uh, would, that, would that not just be, uh, the best thing for, for a country. This is uh, just one of my personal questions I wanted to put out to you. Um, is it ever likely to happen? What do you think? And it's for, for anybody who has a... Okay. I think you're right. It's a huge chance out there to be able to move value around within a couple of seconds through the entire world. You know, that's massive. And we didn't talk about uh, uh, how to 
allow financial inclusion in developing countries and emerging countries. In the future, you just need to have a smartphone, internet and electricity, and then you can store and money and move money around. That's really massive. You get to have identity con management under control. That's fine, but it's a huge chance for financial inclusion. And we also uh, didn't really touch uh, the machine economy yet. That's probably something for another panel. In the future, there will be uh, millions or hundred millions of devices being connected to the internet, like machines, I don't know, cameras, cars, trucks, they will all start autonomously engage uh, in payment transfer. And of course, this will be DLT based. I have no doubt here. So therefore, I absolutely agree. It's a huge chance. And there should be much more energy flowing into these areas, uh, not by us here in the call. You know, we are doing, I think, as much as we can, but also by more senior decision makers who have a potential budget, uh, which needs to be rooted in this fascinating, innovative area. Uh, I'm very pro here, as you see. Uh, um, I have to be pro because so many people are con, so I'm even more pro. And I would like to bring up the, the big risk here. Uh, I think uh, putting the whole currency of a country into the, the blockchain is also a huge risk. Uh, I would like to say the, the history of Ethereum and the attacks on the blockchain on, on the Ethereum association with a smart contract showed that if you do not really 100% uh, close all the loopholes, somebody could find a way uh, to quickly move away all your assets. And uh, if it's digital, it's very fast, as we just said. So I think we need a lot of, of risk assessment and conceptual work before we would allow that. And even the adoption, uh, yeah, more people, more interest, more criminals, of course, is also my, my thinking here on the widespread adoption. I, I, I agree. Um, it's definitely uh, a space that's been, you know, hacked and came and come back from that multiple times. So um, one can only imagine that people will uh, need to stay vigilant and uh, keep keep working um, on shoring up the currencies as as they're as they're released um, and in circulation. Um, we are we have come to the end of our time. Um, so I would like to, um, I guess, what's left is to just thank thank you for joining, um, and for your insights. And um, I, I feel wiser, so I, I hope our audience do. Um, and I hope that everybody watching enjoys the rest of the conference. So um, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Lorenz. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Freya, and thank you, other panelists, and thank you, the birds in the background. Our next speaker comes from Raiffeisen Bank International, which has been a partner of...